Rebecca Fons, Programming Director of Film Scene. Thanks so much for watching Fantastic Fungi through Film Scene's virtual screening room. This film is presented as part of our Science on Screen program. Film Scene is proud to again be a recipient of the Science on Screen grant, which is an initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Stick around after the film, following the credits, for a recording of a conversation we hosted live, virtually, with Sarah DeLong Duhan and Janice McDonald. We discussed the Prairie State's Mushroom Club, what happens on a mushroom foray, the eternal power of fungus, and more. Enjoy. Uh, hello to our live virtual audiences. My name is Rebecca Fons, and I am Film Scene's Programming Director. Uh, I want to welcome you to this discussion of the film Fantastic Fungi. Uh, the film and discussion that we are presenting are part of the third year of Film Scene See that we're streaming live on Facebook. So oh, yeah, and I'm going to mute you. There we go. <laughs> uh, so it's the, this film is part of our third year of our Science on Screen program, and our final Science on Screen film in 2020 is Coded Bias, which will be available to watch for free in our virtual screening room starting Wednesday, November 18th, so a week from today. Uh, and we'll be hosting a live Facebook conversation with the film's director, Shalini Kantaya, and University of Iowa professor Deborah Whaley on Friday, November 20th. So you can find um, all of our Science on Screen programming and virtual offering info at our website, which is icfilmscene.org. Um, and Film Scene is, again, so proud to be the recipient uh, of a Science on Screen grant for the third year. Um, and Science on Screen is an initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, tonight, we are excited to dive into the magic beneath our feet with two special guests. Um, and before I introduce them, if you are tuning in and you haven't yet watched the film Fantastic Fungi, you can catch it for about two more weeks in our virtual screening room. And the film was originally scheduled for our screens in March, but we had to cancel. And so we're really happy that we're still able to present the film this year and host the conversation. If you have questions about the film uh, or questions about the conversation or questions to our guests, uh, please drop those in the comments uh, below and we will do our best to address those as we go along. So joining me tonight to talk about fungi are Dr. Excuse me, are Dr. Are Sarah DeLong, uh, DeLong Duhong, soon to be doctor, uh, and Janice McDonald, AKA Jan. Uh, Sarah is a master's student at the University of Iowa in the Integrated Biology program. She is a board member at large for the Prairie States Mushroom Club, a fellow of the Iowa City Science Booster Club, and an employee of Iowa City Parks and Recreation. Broadly, she is interested in biodiversity and evolution, particularly in fungi. Her research subject is sterium, often called false turkey tail. And Jan has a BGS from the University of Iowa and is an amateur naturalist, Iowa master conservationist, professional mushroom hunter, and is certified in morel identification. She has studied medicinal herbs and mushrooms for a number of years and served as herb specialist, wellness manager, apothecary manager, and as a leader with taproot nature experience. And she has an amazing ode and shrine to mushrooms behind her. So I'm excited to talk about that too. So Sarah and Jan, welcome to the conversation. Hello. Hello. So um, first I wanted to talk about since um, Sarah, you are currently very involved with the Prairie States Mushroom Club. Jan, you have been involved. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about what the Prairie States Mushroom Club is? Yeah, so we actually have a really good description on our website, which I'll pretty much just quote here because it's perfect. So the Prairie States Mushroom Club promotes scientific and educational activities related to fungi and fosters the appreciation of wild and, and cultivated mushrooms. We advocate the sustainable use of mushrooms as a resource and endorse responsible mushroom collecting that preserves natural areas and their biological diversity. The general purpose is um, practical and scientific study of fungi and gathering, dissemination, and perpetuation of facts and knowledge on that subject. Um, and the primary objective shall be study of specimens collected by members and others and the exchange of information with other organizations and professional mycologists. So I've actually created a, a sort of an offshoot organization with the help of Prairie States Mushroom Club, which is the Iowa Fungal Biodiversity Project where we're sequencing a number of fungi that we've collected from forays that we've gone on. Foray being, we run around in the woods and look for mushrooms. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind that's of, amazing. Uh, that's the point. Do you feel like, so I am not a biologist, <laughs> shocker. You don't have to uh, uh, But so that, that was my question, like if someone's just sort of interested in mushrooms like as a casual or interested in fungi casually, like could someone get involved, you know, like, or I guess maybe, can you talk a little bit about like who are the members of the club? 
Yeah, absolutely. The members are people who are curious enough to actually just come to forays and like walk around with us and ask questions. You don't have to be an expert. All you need to do is be curious. And there's a good name for people who aren't like academically involved or have, um, you know, years of experience and it's just citizen scientists. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good descriptor for that. That's and great. actually, we should all be citizen scientists, really. I mean, we should, yeah. we should endeavor to be citizen scientists. And most of the people who make these leaps and strides in mycology, like, aren't from academia at all. Like Paul Samets, for example, from the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's good to know. And I mean, who doesn't want to go on a mushroom foray? And I want to hear about yeah. this in a little bit. Um, <laughs> so when we talk about how people can get involved. Oh, please go, go ahead, Jan. It's just a great, um, initially, if, especially as a beginner, if you're not, um, if you don't know a lot about different mushrooms and are, but want to learn more about identifying them, going on a foray with the Mushroom Club is just a great way to not only meet great people, but to, to learn so many different species all at once, because you've got a, 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 a larger amount of people collecting in, a, in an area, and it, very beneficial for making friends and for identifying mushrooms. So. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So um, I would imagine that for the most part, maybe, maybe these citizen, sci citizen scientists or, 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 um, or people who are maybe not haven't watched the film yet, when they think about fungi, we were sort of joking about the, the dumb like fungi jokes that there are, or like the mushrooms on your pizza, you know, the frozen mushrooms. So I, I don't know that people really get a sense of what fungi really is and, 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 and how really connected to every part of human existence it is, which I think the film does a fantastic job of really laying out and showing in, a, in this beautiful um, sort of animation of all the different fungi and, and time-lapsed um, uh, film footage. So if you had to give sort of like a fungi, you're like a fungi 101 elevator pitch, or you had to kind of like quickly explain or, or kind of uh, give someone the gravity of this organism, how would either of you do that? Jen, you want to go or you want me to start? Well, I, I think I should defer to you for the, your scientific <laughs> piece on this, but. Sure. So the kind of mushroom that you eat on your pizza, it's only one species of mushroom. That's the button mushroom. It's Agaricus bisporus. Um, they come in white, they come in brown, and they're also the portobellas that you see, like the big giant ones. It's just a more mature stage of that mushroom. So there's a lot of diversity in morphology. And like, so there's, uh, the most recent estimate is three to five million species of fungi on this planet. And we've only described 200,000 of them. And we only have like DNA sequence sequences for like less, much less than that. So yeah, I've uh, personally identified over 300 species of fungi just here in Iowa alone. And there's, there's like purple ones, there's pink ones, there's orange ones, there's like ones that look like coral that you would find under, you know, underwater. There's some that, that parasitize moths and send up these little white tendrils and stuff. So like, it's just crazy the amount of that biodiversity that you see in mushrooms. And yeah, when you I, see, yeah, go ahead. Well, when you, and this is maybe a really dumb question, but when you say you identify different species, does that mean like you're just like, it's not necessarily, is it a discovery of a new species or you're just like identifying? Just identifying species okay. that just, already exist. My mind was like blown and then it was like blowing even further. And I just wanted to make sure I could bring myself <laughs> back down to planet earth. So. <laughs> I'm sure that the club and myself have like found some species that, that have never been described because there, there are some that like, like um, chanterelles, for example, we think it's just one species, but no, really, there have been a lot of studies that come out showing it's actually a multitude of species that are uh, that pretty much only recently diverged from one another. Um, but yeah, so the the mushroom that you usually find, like imagine the button mushroom that you find on your pizza, that's like the apple, and I think the documentary does that a really good job of explaining that uh, the mushroom is the fruit and the mycelium that's in the dirt or in the soil or in a tree or something like that. That's the actual body of the mushroom. That's the part that really matters. Jan, anything to add about your, about the wild world of mushrooms and, and mycelium? Um, just, well, one thing I would add, you can get a lot more than a button mushroom on a pizza. You can, you can get oysters and shiitake and hirikium and, you know, if you thinly slice your maitake or your sulfur shelf, and there's a lot more to enjoy. But um, 
Um, and I pr much prefer all these other delicious mushrooms that you can find here in the woods from May through November, luckily, um, but, and many other ways to cook them. But yeah, there's a fla there's a diversity of flavor. That's a really good point. That's funny. And I, I, again, I am not like a, you know, an expert at all, but I'm not a mushroom eater. And my husband actually just the other night said, what can I do to convince you to start eating mushrooms? And I was like, I don't know if it's going to get there. And I, you know, I mean, that's not the kind of mushroom, we're, that's not what really we're talking about, but just that it came up in conversation the other day. But how funny that, yeah, what you get at the regular pizza place is not necessarily what we're talking about tonight. Anyway, um, so um, why, and Sarah, maybe you can start with this, why do mushrooms and fungi interest you? Obviously, you're studying it, you, it is your, your field of profession, but also seems like there's a real passion there. So I'd love to hear from you about what interests you about them. Um, and then Jan, I'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah, so it, it's kind of just like a matter of luck that I got into fungi. I could have been a bird watcher or like a plant biologist or something. And I actually did start out with plants. So I worked at the Kirkwood Community Greenhouse as a work study. Um, and then I ended up like identify, having to uh, learn the names and identify all the different tropical plants that I was taking care of. And I found that I was really good at this and I really liked it. So I tried to take it out into nature, got discouraged because all I could find was invasive plants. Um, but then I saw fungi and I started like digging into that and I'd find one, identify it, find one, identify it. And then as I did it, I got better and better and I kind of never stopped. <laughs> and the reason I started researching that uh, fungi is because sterium, I couldn't figure out which ones were which. Like there were a bunch of a different species, but the descriptions of them were all like so similar uh, on morphology, just like looking at the, here's one right here. <laughs> Just like looking at it, can you tell this one apart from this one? Do you think they're the same or different? I mean, it's kind of a rhetorical question, they're different. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I wanted to figure out if they actually were and like to what extent, so yeah. Jan, what about you? Um, well, I guess my, my father, who was an avid outdoorsman, started taking me mushroom hunting for morels in the spring every year as a kid and ever since then I've you know that's uh, something that I've looked forward to every spring and um, I guess it, it, my time in Iowa City my first um, 30 years of my life or so I didn't have a car and rode my bike in different places and I would, would spend a lot of time searching out woods and uh, would, would just start finding different places to hunt for mushrooms um, um, started finding I actually met Dean Abel many many years ago and I um, not really quite sure how I met Dean, who was a former president of the Mushroom Club, the Prairie States Mushroom Club, and actually introduced me to it years ago. Um, uh, sorry to get on that tangent, but anyway, I start, started hunting mushrooms as a kid, love hunting them now, but more, um, um, I love cooking them and, and, and using them medicinally for different reasons. I'm very grateful for um, turkey tail mushroom, similar, similarly to Paul Stamets' mother in the movie. I was prescribed turkey tail mushroom, the, um, not the the sterium is a false turkey tail but i was prescribed the true turkey tail mushroom seven years ago when i was fighting breast cancer and used it successfully to help boost my immune system and to help um to complement the chemotherapy that i was going through um which inter interesting enough came from i i did a used a type of chemo called doxorubicin which which uh, originally came from s soil at the base of a italian castle um, that a microbiologist was studying beneficial soil microbes and discovered that famous chemo form of chemotherapy. So I actually am grateful for both of those things from nature to help help to save my life. Um, that's another thing that makes me very excited about mushrooms other than hunting them. <laughs> and you, you have mushrooms behind you. Can you tell us a little bit about what we see behind you? Well, um, I, you know, I love collecting mushrooms in the woods, but I also collect mushroom books and some mushroom art. And um, I have some dried morels and um, a Chris, Christmas ornaments and dried um, different species of mushrooms that I've collected over the years. That, um, just, just a variety of different things. I'm kind of um, obsessed with them. I'm obsessed with hunting them and, and you know, from May through November. Um, and I, I spend far too much time um, and go far too many miles. This year, one of my favorite parks was closed due to COVID. It was some, on some university property, but my husband found a path that, um, that if I spent three hours hiking across that path, I could connect to that set of 
forest, which was amazing because no one else was there. And I, you know, there was a coyote laying in the road and I found mushrooms along the roadside as opposed to deeper in the forest. And uh, it was magical. That's awesome. And you know, something that is sort of like a silver lining to the virtual conversation is like, we would not normally see this if we were doing this conversation in person. So it's cool to see your, your display behind you. Um, yeah, I, I want to ask uh, Sarah you this question about this this I naturalist um, that you were telling telling us about before we oh, yeah. connected um, over Zoom. Yeah, so I naturalist is is one of the things that sort of like got me down this rabbit hole of identifying because it is a really good identification tool, especially for somebody who like has no clue where to start, which I think is most of us. Um, so it actually uses a, an artificial intelligence. They just call it computer vision to I try to identify your photos, try to match it to like a species. Um, and here's what the app looks like. So there's my list of things that I've identified recently. Um, and then you can also explore other people's identifications. Here's like a map. And you can just, all these dots are things that people have observed and maybe it'll load outside of that little block, but you know, it'll just populate this whole thing with it. So. You upload a picture, uh, GPS coordinates, it just gets it from your phone, it's easy. Um, and basically a date and time, it just gets it from the uh, photo metadata. And then you can leave comments or whatever. The app will give, will offer an identification that you can consider, or at least it'll get you somewhere. Uh, some, sometimes in, on certain things, it's really wrong a lot of the time, but. <laughs> and then other people who use iNaturalist can chime in and offer an identification based on their expertise. So you can just like, it's a web page, it's a, um, an app, and it's really easy to use. And if you don't like that, then you can use the other app that they have called Seek, which is actually really good for children. You just like point it at something and then it's just like, ah. it kind of takes a second to, to analyze the video and try to figure out what it is. But it's cool. That is should cool. Use it. <laughs> well, and also like it's, you know, it creates this, you know, this web of, of, of digital picture of what sort of the film, I think, does a good job of explaining, like, it, they're everywhere, you know, it's just yeah. this, like, this, this constant discovery and constant um, understanding of just, like, how just, Im like, immersive and, and everywhere the, um, the world of fungi is, so it's cool that they're you could, like, air, actually sort of see, yeah, soil. yeah, and that you could see, like, where they are in your area, too, is really cool, and Indeed. also, it being interactive and like sharing a community is really neat. Yeah, and the other cool thing is we use this for, for research purposes. So if enough, if enough people uh, identify your observation, it becomes research grade, which basically just helps us understand that there's been a consist consensus and it's more likely to be right. And so we can search for uh, like a certain um, organism very easily. So I troll this website all the time to see where different sterium are and like correct people's identifications and offer my own and stuff like that. And one of the things that I'll be doing for my continued research into sterium is reaching out to people and getting them to send me these specimens from even across the world. Mm -hmm. And like that's going to be my main method of getting these research specimens to sequence and to put in like a family tree basically. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. That's so cool. That's cool. Um, we have some, we, I have more questions, but we have some questions from the audience and I want to go to those so we can get to, because some of them are, there's really, really great questions. So, um, and we maybe touched on this a little bit and maybe you know that if you've discovered a mushroom that hadn't, or a fungi that had not been discovered before, if either of you made that discovery, either that you figured out through iNaturalist or through your research. research. I haven't discovered anything yet and it's, a little bit of a chore to like describe it formally and stuff. But the one thing that I did do, and actually this is directly what I did in my research is so the false turkey tail that you find here in the US and purportedly throughout the world, but yeah, that's up for debate. It's called Sterium austria. Genus name, species name. Sterium is the genus, austria is the species name. Um, yeah, I, I won't go into explaining how <laughs> taxonomy <laughs> works and nomenclature and stuff but so I discovered that there are actually three different species but they've been named before so mm -hmm. what can happen is if somebody thinks that you know two species look enough alike they can make them synonyms so be like oh this this thing was actually inappropriately described twice it's really the same thing well this has happened in the sterium but it wasn't true <laughs> 
So these two would be considered Styrium ostrea. This one is actually Styrium lobatum. This one is Styrium fasciatum. And they have different textures. So this one has these like chestnut colored bands and it's a bit more like lobate, like scalloped almost. And this one's a bit hairier, sort of grayer as you can see. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have any of those bands showing through. And that's the main difference. And it, like, it wasn't enough for these people who originally described it. But so we're doing this all the time. We're, we're picking apart one species and actually finding out that there are multiple or like maybe even hundreds, especially for pathogens and stuff that mm -hmm. evolved so quickly, especially along with humanity and our agricultural crops. Yeah, that's so, so it's like you're sort of d d discovering something that's been discovered before, but discovering yeah. it in a new way. Yeah, exactly. Um, there was another really great question. I think this came from Lucy or Mac. So they asked, chicken of the woods is a recent delicious discovery. We've encountered it in the wild a few times, but we weren't sure if there were any relatives that might be harmful. Any tips for safe identification and hunting? And I think you, could, you can both probably answer that. Dan, you want to go first? I think it's pretty, I mean, sometimes on, um, sometimes I think people find an orange mushroom and they think it might be chicken because they've, but, but they're actually finding jack-o'-lantern, but I don't really think they look anything alike. Um, the jack-o'-lantern grow generally out of the um, ground and are each individual orange mushrooms that are actually bioluminescent, whereas the chicken of the woods is a shelf mushroom and it's, um, it's a kind of a, it's also known as sulfur shelf and it's, um, more of a shelf. It doesn't have a stem like a jack-o'-lantern. Um, but a common thing about ch chicken of the woods is that it, it's commonly harvested far too late. I love to find it when it's super young, when it still looks like candy corn, or just harvesting the very edge of it because um, 50 to 80 percent of the time, according to most of my cookbooks, and I would concur just with experience, people, it, it's too fibrous and chewy and people aren't really harvesting it young enough. And on some of the online mushroom groups that I'm in, people say, oh, wait a week and go back and harvest that. And I'm like, no, harvest that now. It's perfect now. But I think it's pretty, I don't really think there are any uh, any false lookalikes. There is, a, There are a couple of different varieties that you can find locally, one with a white underside and an, and one with a yellow underside, but they're generally orange on top. Yep. Oh, I, would, I just had something in my brain I was gonna say. Um, yeah, so most polypores, I think except one that you can find here, which uh, wouldn't be very appetizing anyway, they're not toxic, they're not gonna hurt you. And so there's a difference between there's gilled mushrooms, they have gills on the bottom, and polypores, which have pores on the bottom, they're the little tubes. Uh, polypores generally won't hurt you, but only the very, very soft ones are tasty, such as chicken of the woods and um, uh, hen of the woods. Very confusing name, I know. <laughs> uh, and things Actually, like that. Go ahead, Jen. It, it is so confusing. It is so confusing. And when I went and got certified to, to be able to sell morels um, at Iowa State University, ironically enough, the professor that was doing the certification misidentified and had reversed the identification of chicken of the woods and hen of the woods. And, and, um, and I, I was kind of just aghast and no one said anything. And I raised my hands and, and, um, and I said, I actually, that's, that's not you know, and, and informed him. And I, I felt like I was kind of frustrated that I had to pay him $50 to get certified. <laughs> <laughs> totally understandable. <laughs> I'm sure there are like lots of like power structures and status structures and like, you know, different like expert levels within the world mm -hmm. of, of this. I'm sure that that's like a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I imagine. But sometimes the people who call themselves fungus experts are the ones who know the least because sure. those of us who've really got into it know that we have so much more to learn. Mm. Sure. Um, that is the problem with common names as opposed to the, you know, the, yes. the genus. So there, Scientific there is names are important. Sure. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, these sort of like household names can, mm -hmm. you know, really kind of lead people to, to wrong understanding, wrong, yeah. wrong understanding, misunderstanding. Same um, thing happens with plants too. People die from eating fall crocus instead of spring crocus. Right. <laughs> wrong season. Yeah. Really wrong. Um, other but questions. Something else. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. 
but I went just about the, the maitake mushroom or the Griffola frondosa, which is the hen of the woods. It does actually look a lot like a hen laying down like the feathers and it blends in perfectly with the oak leaves and it's, it's quite beautiful and it, it's, it, you know, it's easy to, to, to miss. Um, I, I was recently, when I'm thinking about mushroom hunting, I, um, I recently, one thing that, that's so much fun to, to, that makes them so much fun to hunt is that they, they can't run, but they can really hide. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's a treasure hunt to look for them. But the, the maitake mushroom also has several other names that I really love, like the butterfly mushroom or the dancing mushroom, because when people find it, you're supposed to dance with joy. So oh, that's, that's great. one good thing about the common yeah my talkie it almost looks like a rose oh that's beautiful there's a that's you can amazing. actually get these in grow kits they sell them in the store sometimes yeah i've that's seen awesome. them at natural grocers before um another question we had was um can you talk about the role of mycelium in soil ecosystems it's an excellent question ah. so i think the documentary goes into this a little bit but there are certain mushrooms that form mycorrhizal relationships with trees and other plants. So there's also orchid mycorrhizae, they're in a whole nother group. Um, and also there's there's kind of the obvious thing, which is fungi that decompose like leaf litter and wood and stuff. They turn it right back into soil. So tree mycorrhizae, uh, it's basically the, the mycelium uh, connects with the roots and then will provide uh, minerals and nutrients that the plant doesn't usually get or like be an extension of the roots to get places the plant doesn't get in exchange for sugar, which the tree usually has more than enough of. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just really, really cool. There's like millions of different species probably of mycorrhizal mushrooms. Oh, I'm trying to think of like, yeah, so morels are mycorrhizal, chanterelles are mycorrhizal. There's so freaking many. <laughs> and a lot of these trees can't live without these partnerships. Yeah. And do you, that sort of leads to that question of like, you know, obviously fungi is so important to our climate. I mean, do you see with climate change and with, you know, with the things that we're, we're seeing that change, that maybe feel more like people see a storm or they see the rising temperatures and they're like, oh, climate change, but like what's happening underneath the ground? And, and I don't know if that, that's a big question to unpack, but yeah. if you have thoughts on that. There's actually starting to be some research into how fungi can be useful for predicting and telling the consequences of climate change. Mm. So um, soil fungi, 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 there I go, using both <laughs> pronunciations. We'll get into that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, soil fungi, the composition changes and, and the same with the bacteria in the soil and all this. They have different temperature ranges that they can tolerate or be most successful in. So if for some reason it gets too warm and they can't outcompete the other things that are trying to use the same resource as them, right. they're gone. And we don't know what those consequences are. And I've actually seen some evidence personally of like big fungi, like macro fungi, like shelf fungi, moving further north than they normally are. Mm. And there's some examples of these uh, actually like becoming potentially invasive. So being introduced into a, a range that they're not native to, being extremely prolific, and then suddenly they're everywhere and it's, you just see nothing but that. So a good example is golden oyster mushrooms. And um, I don't have a good common name for this, but Trimedes gibbosa, which is a big white shelf mushroom that you see around here a lot. Mm. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that's so fascinating that they can be sort of like predictors. They, they can tell us a lot about what's happened in the past, but they can also be predictors of what's, what's in the future. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, is there anything in the film that either of you learned that was new? I mean, to me, it was all new. So I'm just curious if there was anything as people who've studied mushrooms and, and who study them and who are enthusiasts, if there was anything new to you or a new way that something you knew, something you knew, but it was presented in a new way. <laughs> I defer to Janice. Well, I, I personally, I knew that, that plants and trees communicated, but I didn't know that they create that they communicated through mycelium you know i didn't really and i had heard about the you know the mycelium web and and that everything was interconnected but i didn't really realize the depth of how that's how plants communicate and how they survive and that the mycelium helps the plants fight disease and and you know and it's 
and that we can use mushrooms to fight diseases. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, I knew that, but, but, but just the, the, the enormity of it all was, yeah. was, uh, and I just, you know, it wasn't something new, but I just, the cinematography by this Louis Schwartzberg was just mm-hmm. amazing. It was my favorite thing. They showed it in, I don't know whether that was Paris, where they showed it in celebration of uh, the Paris Agreement on the huge buildings. That was just the most spectacular thing I've, you know, I just loved it. And yeah, they gave real gravity you know. to the, the eternal power of the, of the fungi. Um, and uh, there was a question for you, Jan, about if you have any turkey tail tinctures. Um, you know, I, I, I took it in powdered form and I, um, I took it as a standardized supplement through Paul Stamets company, Fungi Perfecti. I took a, a measured dose for a certain amount of time all through my six months of chemo. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, that having a standardized form is important, you know, um, I, and I, I'm kind of uh, prejudiced against using mushroom in tincture form just because of one of my favorite mycologists and herbalists is Christopher Hobbs and his personal, in, in his book, Medicinal Mushrooms, he seemed to favor powdered, uh, the use in powdered form as opposed to using an alcohol struct, um, extract on mushrooms. Um, mm. I think of the effect of the alcohol with the cellulose I'm, I'm not really quite sure so um so no i don't have a turkey tail tincture and i, I don't recommend it in tincture form gotcha um i wanted to uh, go ahead sarah did you have something oh uh, just a little note you can go out in the woods and find turkey tail and uh iNaturalist is actually pretty good at, at identifying it uh so yeah you can you can go find it on your own and you can do a water extraction too, just throw it in your tea for a while. Like it mm. certainly won't hurt you. It may not be as helpful as powdered, but yeah. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, and there was a question that I had and that one of our listeners had was, um, well, I'll ask first about like a mushroom foray. Like we talked about that at the beginning and it sounds like the season is winding down. So May through November yeah. is kind of when that happens. So at the end of the season, but can you talk a little bit more about like th- what a foray is like and, and what, people who would go on one should expect yeah we pretty much just show up at a place park go out in the woods look for mushrooms um usually i am like bouncing around between all these different people who are like sarah come look at this sarah come look at this sarah what what have i got here can you identify identify this for me so (laughs) it gets uh pretty crazy but so you can call on any of us from the mushroom club to come help you and then we also like to bring back a lot of samples to look, just like assemble on a picnic table and look at at the end. And if they're hard to identify, then we get the books out. Um, and if you found something that's delicious, we'll make sure that it is what you think it is so you can take it home and eat it. <laughs> and I try to like, if there's somebody who really wanted to find something tasty, I'm usually not that big into eating mushrooms, or maybe I'm just too lazy to cook them in a reasonable <laughs> amount of time. <laughs> so I'll give mine away. <laughs> Very generous. But, yeah, if you hope to find something, you probably will. That's awesome. Um, Jan, anything to add to that for forays? Well, um, you know, I, I loved going on forays a long time ago, but I really, I really prefer to be in the woods alone. You know, you can see fox, you can see bluebirds, you know, um, you can discover so much more and it's like a treasure hunt. And, you know, I like like most mushroom hunters, I can be fairly competitive about it, but I've also, um, you know, taken people out and taught them how to find the trees that you're going to find morels at or, or chicken of the woods at or maitake. Mm-hmm. Um, but my favorite thing about being in the woods is, is being alone. Yeah. Um, they're also, I just wanted to mention, they're actually mushrooms that taste like shrimp and that, so, so you don't like mushrooms, but you personally, <laughs> um, some of the hericium hir- species which are just only good for a few days. And you can actually find them cultivated versions at, you know, your local uh, grocery store. They're, um, they actually taste like shrimp, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, shrimp or crab, I've heard people say. And uh, yeah, they, they were selling grow kits through the farmer's market, the online farmer's market this year. Mm-hmm. I think that's over. But there's a company in Iowa City that'll sell you some. That's awesome. Did, and were there forays still order. during COVID? Did people still go out because they were outdoors and able to kind of like distance? Or did, did the season so, sort of take a hit? Yeah, we did do some, not as many as normal. Um, plus, I was a little like reluctant to to lead forays on my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, and we had some scheduled through some um, like parks and recreation and stuff that just ended up getting canceled because mm-hmm. they canceled all of their events. Yeah. Um, I hope next year we will have more, and I'll make an effort to schedule some more forays. 
And if you want to keep updated, just Google the Iowa Mushroom Club on Google and you'll find it. Easy. That's where we post all of our forays. If you become a member, we'll also send you like emails if we just decide to go out in the woods one day. Um, so yeah. And yeah, we that also was, have photos from past forays too. Oh, that's great. Yeah, somebody asked how they could get involved in the in the mushroom club. So it sounds like you can yes. just Google Iowa Mushroom Club and you can find information and it's it's an yes. easy it's an easy group to be immediately embraced by. <laughs> yeah, and even if you can't go on a foray or um, you know, don't want to, send us an email, e an email with pictures of mushrooms and we would love to identify them for you. Just like go out in the woods and find something and email uh, either the Iowa mushroom at gmail address, or you can email me at sarahdelongduhan at uiowa.edu. I don't care. I love this stuff. Or <laughs> mushrooms, and, please. And what was the um, the other app that you said that would be good for kids? So there's iNaturalist that is, is maybe a little bit more robust, and then there's something that's a little bit like yep. youth friendly. So the other one is called Seek. It's by iNaturalist. Here's the loading cool. page. And so you pretty much just, um, and sometimes it has like, things on here that are um, challenges. So you start this up and then it just has a video going. And if you point it at something, does it say I'm a human? Yeah. It's awesome. Something. Yeah, good. You made it. <laughs> I did it. I'm a human. So, you know, it takes a second, but if you focus on a thing, you can just like give your kid your phone and they'll just run around being like, what's this? What's That's this? awesome. What's this? And you can post those to iNaturalist too through Seek, but you don't have to. And you don't need an account or anything. That's cool. And I'm going to pass on that. There's a comment from someone that says, Sarah, we'd love to have you join a hike with us uh, this spring at the Good Earth Nature School. So Good we'll, Earth Nature we'll School. connect you somehow. <laughs> I love but that. yeah, you can, find, you can find that information as Sarah said before. Um, so the other questions I have, just as we wrap up, um, and we, we sort of joked about it before, but I found myself tripping over fungi versus fungi versus funga, fungi, uh, gi, gai, e. So can you talk a little bit about the different pronunciations? Because you let me know I, there's nothing really wrong with the way that I was pronouncing it. Yeah, so I actually like did some digging into this because I want it to be right. So you can be fungi, 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 uh, if you go with the classical Roman pronunciation, like classical Latin, it's fungi. Um, doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> no one will, no one will make fun of you if you yep. say a different word, different the way. Botanical yeah. Latin doesn't make yeah. any sense. Fungal. Yes, go fungal, ahead, James. or you could be a fungal. <laughs> okay. I'm sure I will. That's are there are there fungus jokes on forays? I mean, is it pretty serious stuff, or do you guys kind of like joke around and have a good time? We've gone through them all at this point. <laughs> what are we saying? Those are all like on Laffy Taffy, uh, the you know, the Laffy Taffy labels or bazooka joke. Yeah. Um, it's like usually the joke that is made when people you know ask, Can I eat it? Uh, somebody will be like, Yeah, but some you can only eat once. Ah, that's good. That's good. Well, this has been such a lovely conversation and we had such great um, questions from the chat. So I want to thank everybody for that. I know, I mean, I know there's like, we barely cracked the surface, which I think the film does a good job of like really showing this world, but also saying there's so much more to explore, which you even said, Sarah, like, you know, people who really know, know that there's a world more to discover and, and realize. So I think uh, it's a great film to kind of get a first introduction and this conversation has been a really great way to recognize how fungi are part of Iowa and eastern Iowa and there's ways that you can get involved in finding them or being enthusiastic about them and or putting them on your wall like Jan has and Jan you mm -hmm. said you had a 20 year fungi on that in that collection is that right yeah, I have an amanita, a dried amanita that we found a long time ago in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, the top is separated from the stem, which you, is a little rattle. It's pretty fragile right now, um, but it's still there. That's awesome. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Thanks for folks who chimed in on the chat and asked questions. Um, we will be posting this video behind after the Fantastic Fungi film, which is on our website. So if you saw that we were chatting, but you didn't have a chance to tune in, this will actually live right after the film. So you can watch the film and then immediately after the credits roll, um, this conversation will take place. So you can learn a little bit more. Again, we just like barely cracked any surfaces, but it's nice to kind of see folks who are enthusiastic and who are learning and uh, developing kind of the, the world of fungi here locally. So 
Um, thank you both so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Great time. Time.